Hey, we're continuing our study of church history, and we are officially at October of 1900 in Topeka, Kansas, a small band of believers led by Charles Parham, Parham, P-A-R-H-A-M. He started a small Bible school, it was called Bethel Bible School, and the school invited all ministers and Christians who felt a call to forsake everything else and um, preach the gospel to join him in this Bible school. They were required to forsake everything, to sell everything they have or give it away and to enter the school. And no one paid any tuition or no one was paid. So they had to trust God for everything. And so they entered into the school and they uh, studied and prayed and they were all together and they were believing that God would, would uh, answer their prayers and would provide their food and their fuel and their rent and their clothing. Clothing. So no one paid the twi twi paid any kind of tuition um, or board, and they all wanted to be equipped to go to all the ends of the earth. They, it was a missionary type endeavor. And so, um, as they gathered together, and Charles Parham was their leader, they wanted to be equipped to be able to preach the gospel. And they wanted the Bible, the, the, the idea was, is that they wanted the Bible to be equipped and they wanted it to be not just something that they knew in their heads, but something that they knew in their hearts and something they felt that they could um, witness to the ends of the earth, right? That was their only textbook, the Bible. And their purpose was to learn the Bible and make sure that it was active and alive in their lives. So they searched the scriptures and excuse me, I got some things in the way here, so I got to move some stuff around, so I apologize. Um, they searched the scriptures and um, for biblical evidence be because they came across this big problem um, it, when they came across the second chapter of Acts, right? So they began to search the scriptures in December of 1900, so this is October, November, December, three months roughly, Parham sent his students to work and diligently research whether or not um, the, bil the biblical evidence of speaking in tongues or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it wasn't even speaking in tongues then, it was baptism of the Holy Spirit, to search out the scriptures to find out what it said. So these students went diligently to work and they all came back with the same answer, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when it came upon people, um, the early disciples, it, there was indisputable proof that they all spoke with other tongues. So armed with this knowledge, they went to prayer, right? They now sought to have what had worked out or what had occurred in the, the um Acts chapter two in the New Testament, the early church, they wanted that experience for themselves. So Parm called a, um, a late night service or an all night service of prayer watch. That's what they were called as prayer watch and watch night service on December 31st, 1900. And he assembled about 75 people, 40 of them were students, 35 others were serious uh, uh, Christians who, who were about prayer. And one of the students, Agnes Osman, O-Z-M-A-N, Agnes Osman, asked that hands would be laid upon her to receive the Holy Spirit since she decided she she felt that she was to go to foreign lands as a missionary and she felt that she needed this gift or this to be bestowed upon her. Now, this was um, not heard of in, in that day, in that hour. And so according to reports, um, we have some newspaper clippings and some other things, according to Parham, after midnight on January 1st, 1901, so they were there on December 31st, like a watch night service, it's now into uh, 1901, he laid hands on her and he says that he re scarcely repeated about three dozen sentences, you know, so it wasn't a really long prayer when the glory fell on her and she began to speak and they have it noted as the Chinese language. So she spoke in that language for three days. When she attempted to con to let them know what was going on, when she would try to write, she even wrote in Chinese, of which it was a language that she did not know. So for three days, she couldn't speak or write anything but Chinese. And there are newspapers that still have that, um, that report in them that, that people have um, to this day. So they continued that prayer meeting for two more nights and three days. And according to Parham, we all got past any begging and pleadings. And we knew that the blessing was ours and the rest is history, as they say. 
And so that's the beginning of Pentecostalism or what we might even say um, uh, charismatic ism. And we'll be following Charles Parham, who, who then eventually goes into Houston. And um, when he's there in Houston, um, a man, uh, Seymour, uh, comes to some of his meetings. And then, of course, we know C Seymour goes out to California, and we have the Azusa Street Revival. But out of that's how we get to the Azusa Street, right? From Charles Parham, from this uh, prayer meeting that occurred in the 1900s. And we also, um, during that time, there were several um, uh, several other um, revivals and awakenings that occurred during that time. One of those during that time period was Maria Edward, um Maria <laughs> Adder Woodworth. I can't even, couldn't even think of her name. But we'll be talking about her more in the future. So um, in uh, six years later, in the Topeka, Kansas newspaper, it was reported that Charles Par Parham, it was Charles F. Parham, but whatever, he claimed the distinction of having organized the religious sect known as the Holy Rollers. So that was in 1906. And um, it, it was organized or it, it came out of what happened and what occurred in Topeka, arranging for a mass meeting on Sunday in the city or auditorium. And Reverend Parham says that he founded it in Topeka and nearly six years prior, so that was in the 1900s. And um, the order created quite a sensation when it was in the thrones of conception. And the following uh, of Parham kept a watchtower of prayer work night and day, and the petitioner asked that the miracles spoke of in Acts be repeated for their benefit. So these people set about going after the gifts and the miracles that were in Acts chapter two and in the book of Acts actually, and that they agree that all of their wishes were granted in January 1st of 1906 and that they were all be able to they were able to speak all languages. So the ripple effect of all these prayer meetings and the ripple effect of people setting their hearts to go after something that they saw in scripture is that we see that several um, ministries were launched, major healing ministries, uh, uh, evangelism ministries, and they ultimately gave birth to the assemblies of God, the Church of God, um, the Church of God in Christ and the Pentecostal uh, Assemblies of the World, as well as many other several denominations and thousands of missionaries who uh, started churches all over the world. And all of this was accomplished in 10 years with no formal organization in spite of the limitations on communications and on travel and that were part of the life at that time uh, uh, during the century. So um, this is back when they didn't have the internet right? internet, right? They didn't have telephones. They didn't have the type, I don't think they had telephones. They didn't have the type, types of transportation and the things that are available, available to us today. So um, what I really wanted to focus on is Charles Parham and his desire that they would search the scriptures and then pray for what they found after they searched the scriptures. And one of the things that I think it's really important for those of us who was in, are in charismatic, charismatic, right, or Pentecost, or uh, spirit-filled, or Holy Ghost-filled, or filled with the baptism, or those who are after sign miracle, signs, miracles, and um, evidence, right, of what we see in the, the scripture occurring today. It's very important that we also link with that the Word of God, because we get too much spirit and we blow up, right? I don't know if it's really truly possible to get too much spirit, but we can get off into Lulu land when we are not grounded by the word. And so if we have the word without the spirit, it's just the letter of law is death, right? And so it's all dry and it dries up and it becomes rules and regulations. And so the word without the spirit is dead and it dries up. And then on the other hand, the spirit without the word blows up, right? Because it just gets out in strange land and it's not attached to anything and it doesn't have any form. It doesn't have any guidance and it's where a lot of error can come in. So right from the very beginning, it was that they found something in scripture and then they went after it. They didn't go after something and then try to apply it to scripture. And I think that's one of the errors we need to be very careful with. And the only way that we can be versed in what is of God and was, what isn't of God is by knowing God's word. And so here we have um, what happened in 1900 um, 
through 1906, somewhere in there, we have newspaper clippings and, and a lot of church records that occurred where the baptism of the Holy Spirit came here in the United States. So this is our session on church history, and I hope you join me in the next few sessions and the previous ones. God bless you.